Okay, well, welcome everybody um, to uh, the Bitcoin meetup here. We're going to learn a little bit more about Bitcoin um, than you might already know. Um, but before I start, I need a volunteer. Yeah. All right, so I'm Sarah. I'm from Block Trail, and I'm going to talk to you today about Bitcoin. But first, I'm going to give you 50 euro. No way. Right? But I'm, you don't get to keep it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so I, I own this 50 euro, right? Everybody's watching me. And now he owns this 50 euro. And you know, we know this because I just physically gave it to him, and now it's in his possession. <laughs> and, if, <laughs> and if I want the 50 euro back, <laughs> he gives it to me. Now, a question to the group. How would you do this over the internet? How would you give somebody money right now? Just one-to-one, -one, back and forth, where it's just very simple, $50. I can give the answer you don't want to hear. I, want to use, I would use DigiCash. I have no idea what that is. No, no. It's well, a Dutch invention from 30 years ago. OK. Well, basically, need to uh, get a piece of something tangible, which would be a code that has to make its way to the other party, and you have to make sure that there's no two of the same code in the YouTube. Yeah. That's it. Like. So that's not as easy as this, right? Nope. Okay. So, all right, thanks. Sweet. So I just wanted to demonstrate here um, one of the opening lines of the, uh, the white paper where uh, the anonymous creator, Satoshi Nakamoto, he states, digital cash. So he created a way by which an individual could change money or give money or, or um, receive money from another anonymous individual or maybe even their friend, peer-to-peer, uh, one-to-one. Right now, um, it, without Bitcoin, the only way to really do these things is you know, with PayPal or with um, credit card or something like that, or bank account. So instead of me giving Kyoto, I, I, I don't know why I can't say your name. Instead of me giving him the 50 euro, maybe first I give it to Ruben, and Ruben validates, oh yes, this is 50 euro, I'm gonna take uh, one euro, and then only gives him 49. So there's a third party in play. Um, and that third party, as we know, can, cannot always be trusted. So Bitcoin was created as a way for that to no longer exist. But to do that, you need to solve a bunch of problems. Um, the main problem you need to solve is trust. How do you make sure that you're able to do this transaction without trust being needed? If we all trusted each other, then I could quite easily send the code you so described without uh, worrying about double spend or hacking or any of these things, but we know that that's not the world today. So that's how Bitcoin uh, started to be conceptualized in the mind of Satoshi. So how many people know about Bitcoin already? I just want to gauge a sense of the room. Okay, so everybody basically raised their hand. How many people know a lot? <laughs> how many, okay, you. And how many people are like beginners? Okay, all right, awesome. All right, so I'm going to start a little bit from the beginning, and then if it's too much in the beginning, we can move forward. But I don't have a presentation. It's not meant to be like one of those like really high, uh, deep technical talks. Save that for Ruben at the end. He'll do a few minutes. Um, so if you have any questions, like just feel free to like, interrupt me or whatever. So back in uh, back in 2009, um, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, he's anonymous. People don't know who he is. He delivered a white paper and basically it described blockchain tech. Uh, or that was 2008, rather. And in 2009, he actually released the software for it. So people think he's an academic because a lot of um, what Bitcoin is modeled after is all different mathematical principles um, and cryptography. And when he released the code, people were like, oh, this kind of shit. <laughs> like, the code wasn't, wasn't perfect. So it was good, but it wasn't perfect. So people argue that he was an academic. Um, so let, let me uh, let me fast forward. Let me rewind back. Um, 
Has anybody seen uh, the movie uh, with Alan Turing recently uh, with the Enigma machine? Okay. So everybody rem in in the World War II, there was the Enigma machine, and it was a piece of machinery that sent coded messages from uh, Germany to its fleet during the war. And to crack that code, it changed every day, so it changed every 24 hours. To crack that code would take millions of human years for a human mind to go and write all things. <clears throat> and they basically had teams of people on the Allies that would try to crack this code. And finally, Alan Turing, which was released, I think, only in 2000 six, something like that, when a few years before the movie was um, created, um, British intelligence released that Alan Turing actually created this machine that cracked the Enigma. You're, why is this important to Bitcoin? Because it dealt with a lot of um, cryptography. Back from generals in, of Rome to modern day warfare to what is now computer software, cryptography is an encoded message. It means that I could send you this 50 euro in code and not have anybody be able to hack it. So Alan Turing, when he created the machine that cracked the Enigma, he basically had to make sure that the compute power that he built in his um, uh, metal and uh, his giant machine was strong enough to run through all these options every 24 hours. And he was able to do that and able to crack it. And he actually started what is modern day computing. And all of um, software today uses um, encryption and uses cryptography to be uh, created so that I could send information over a network and not have it be hacked. So this is also, cryptography is also um, a whole field of computer science that I won't try to pretend to know. Um, Ruben here knows a lot of it. But a lot of cryptography and mathematics are behind Bitcoin, and they are the reason. It is the reason why it works and is unhackable. So, math one plus one equals two. Um, that's always a truth. And when people say, you know, Bitcoin is something that could be hacked or could be um, could be destroyed, it actually can't because it uses mathematics. This explanation will all make sense as I get further, further into um, the talk here. So, Bitcoin, what is it? It's a, um, a way, it's a digital currency. It runs on the blockchain. So the blockchain is the vehicle by which Bitcoin is able to, to operate and come into this world. Uh, the blockchain is a series of um, transaction blocks. So let's think about, let's bring it to a thing we all know, banks. Um, let's take ING. If you're ING, you have a ledger, and you could see what everybody's spending. Um, you could see when they withdraw from their ATM, you could see when they write a check, uh, when they use their credit card. And this is all put in order, and you're able to subtract from an account, add to an account, and all this information is stored in data centers they own. They spend millions of dollars on these, billions of dollars on these data centers, on security to protect them. You as the consumer trust that the, the, um, the ledger is accurate. With uh, Bitcoin, the, everybody has access to this ledger. So everybody knows exactly what is spent, how it work, um, who is spending what. Um, and instead of names on accounts, it's all, uh, it's all numbers. So it's all addresses, 80 character addresses. But if everybody has access to the ledger and knows exactly what is spent and used, then there can't be any deception because everybody is able to see it. So the Bitcoin um, core client houses all this information and every time anybody in the world can download it. And when you download it, your computer becomes part of the network and you have the ability to donate your compute to help the network grow. So the since, the, since there is no massive data center that controls the Bitcoin network and nobody pays the electricity bill and the cooling for all these things, um, everybody in the network is responsible to keep the ledger in order. Because you don't want to have double spend. You don't want to spend the same Bitcoin twice. So the way that it's kept in order is with blocks. 
So about every 10 minutes, a block is created that validates all the transactions and puts them in order that just happened in those previous 10 minutes. So this way you're able to see what happens when in the exact millisecond that it happened in a ranking order. And these are why it's called, this is why it's called a blockchain, because one block links to the next block and links to the next block. And these are all the Bitcoin transactions. Now, when you're in, when you have, when you're into the uh, Bitcoin network, you're able to mine these blocks. Um, the first block was called the Genesis block, and at that time, uh, Bitcoin nobody really knew about it, and the compute power on your phone or on your computer was enough to donate to help mine these blocks. Um, these blocks are mined through a hash rate problem, math problem. So you might be, this might start be starting to get a little bit uh, complex, but the, the Satoshi said, "How do I make sure that uh, people want to um, validate transactions? Why would they want to donate their compute power?" Well, the, the reason is every time somebody validates these transactions, they get a reward of Bitcoin. Today, that reward is 25 BTC, but I think it started off at what was it? 50? Okay, started off at 50. Um, so every time you donate your compute power to, to solve this math problem, to validate the transactions in your block, you received, to start 50, it halved. So now it's 25, which today is 25 times about 200 euro. So it's not a small amount of money. So everybody in the network buys to um, solve these hash rate math problems so that they're able to, they're incentivized to donate their compute to order the ledger because if they are the first ones to solve the problem, then they get these 25 BTC. Now, what's a hash rate math problem? Um, has anybody seen a spy movie when they try to crack a safe? All right, so some, so you're watching a James Bond movie and there's big safe and they're trying to crack it, you know, I see they plug in some tool and it runs through every option possible until it finally like gets to an option. That's how I think of it in my head at least. Um, there, every time a block is validated, the output of that block becomes the input of the next block. And they need to then solve this hash rate problem. And the level of difficulty is so hard right now, you need to throw compute at it. So. Think about in that movie when they're putting in their one machine and it's, it's fast enough to think through the, you know, the five combination lock and crack it in like 45 seconds. Well today it takes thousands of servers, um, about 10 minutes to solve each problem, to validate each transaction block. So there's no longer miners with like their computers um, or a stack of their computers mining blocks. Um, it's now giant server farms and uh, big mining pools that are mining these blocks. But they are what allows the, 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 the Bitcoin network to continue because every, every time a block is mined, the network gets a message that says, okay, this block has been mined, we're going to move on to the next one, and then that spits out a message to the network. So the network always follows the longest block. So everybody in the network has access to everything that's happening at once, and they're able to see the, the blocks as they're created every 10 minutes and as the messages get sent out to more nodes on the network, it becomes a source of truth. And people are incentivized in the network to um, validate these blocks to earn the Bitcoin. They also earn the transaction fees and they're decentivized to do anything negative to the blocks because they want to be able to have value for their coins they already have and they want to, to buy for these 25 blocks, so 25 BTC. So miners, people that are validating these transactions, they're the ones that are keeping the, <coughs> the ecosystem alive and going. But anybody in the whole community, anybody who has the Bitcoin core client, they're able to know and see every transaction that's ever happened ever. Now that's a lot of information. I see faces like getting like, like I'm talking in another language. So is this helping or is this too much? Or is this, is it making sense? Did you talk a little 
Yeah, I could talk louder. You should have said that at the beginning. <laughs> What happens if someone tries to spend like one Bitcoin at, at the same time? That's a great question. So, uh, what, so, all right. So, in a bank account, right? Um, let's take the 50, 50 year out again. All right. In the, say I have fifty euro in my bank account, right? And what, I spend five euro. My bank account's going to say forty five euro left. But for Bitcoin, it doesn't work that way. Um, for you to know, I have 45 euro left. You'll actually see, I started with 50, then I spent five. So it, it calculates every transaction that there's 45 euro left. It doesn't take the remaining balance. It doesn't take, so every coin has a full history. And the only way you know um, what is the, the, the balance of an address, um, you're able, it, it reports every calculation, every transaction, it goes back in time and adds up all its history to tell you what is left in that address. You can't double spend. Does that make sense? So basically you say it's not only paper balances, like I take 30, I, get, uh, I take 30, I spend 20, there's 10 plus, and you have no idea which one is going to in a normal bank. So in the bank you just like, yeah, in the bank it's just the balance, yeah, just the balance. and you have to believe in that balance. In the Bitcoin network, every calculation is, as every transaction, the calculation is added and validated, and you're able to do that because every core client has the full history of the ledger. So you're able to instantaneously calculate every time what it should be. But if everyone has the history, why is it still used by criminals or whatever, people who want to stay semi-anonymous? Uh, yeah, so the history is, is a lot, it's all mathematics. So an address is, is, is an 80 character number, a private key is also numbers, but uh, criminals who use Bitcoin, it is anonymous to an extent. But you could also do some calculation because, like I said, every coin has a history and a transaction history. And let's say you're a criminal and you're hiding behind these addresses that are, you know, anonymous basically. But if you're um, using a different, using the same address twice, and say one of your purchases was something that's able to be tracked, say you use Bitcoin at a bar to buy a beer, and uh, somebody, you know, overheard a conversation and noticed you were, I don't know, a criminal or whatever. And then they're able to take that address that you also use for something else, and, and then they could see um, that there were coins that were used in both places. You could tie it together. So even though there are no names or identities around Bitcoin, it's not completely anonymous. Although there are, it is easy to use as a criminal. It doesn't make it 100% anonymous because you're able to go through the code and the transaction history, and you could eventually tie something to, to a person. Um, I'm trying to picture block. Uh, how would you describe it? And are there differences in length between blocks, for example? Because you said that nowadays there's more time needed to mine a block. Yeah. So a, a, a block basically takes all of the transactions that happened in the previous period of time before the, the last block. So it's an uh, ongoing yeah. ledger. Yeah. So it could be different sizes. Uh, the maximum size that it could contain right now is a hundred. Uh, is one MB worth of data. Okay. But it could represent um, different transaction amounts every time. Um, like that was new to mine the block. Depending upon how many transactions occurred. Um, so right now the blocks aren't full. So there's lots of space for more transactions to happen. But one of the uh, big arguments in the community right now are is increasing the block size because people believe that if it becomes like a viable world's currency, you'll need more space to be able to house all the transactions that will happen. So they're thinking of like expanding it into a larger size. Um, but yeah, it's not like a hundred transactions every time. It could be like, um, you know, a thousand, you know, five hundred. Depends on how many happen. Just to give you guys an idea, there's about a hundred thousand transactions a day right now in Bitcoin. All right, uh, two questions. Uh, so first of all, you said that these big, uh, big ass mining farms and, and uh, mining.
trying to close. They, uh, they are the only ones that actually uh, make viable to mine these products because of superior processors, things, uh, access to cheap uh, electricity, probably somewhere in high central or whatever. Yeah. Um, isn't this in a way like also creating a central bank, like you can have only like five huge pools mining all of the coins in the okay. world? That, that's a great question. That's actually segueing into the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, so maybe I'll do that and then you can ask your second. Okay, then my second question uh, is it good to hide taxes? Hide uh, taxes? To hide, like the way I see it, uh, the anonymity gives you the chance to get money, which is basically almost like cash, so you can not pay taxes. Um, yeah, so that's, it depends what country you live in. There's different regulations that are popping up in all different countries that will um, value your Bitcoin assets as something um, that you need to like report on or not. Like I think in the US they just announced that it's going to be considered um, uh, a commodity. So if you don't report it and it is considered that and you're supposed to pay a cer certain tax on that, you could be, you know, held so accountable. If commodities, it's going to be like in your personal balance sheet, it's going to be like oil, so, so an investment for like piece of gold or like cash. Yeah, a lot of that's still to be determined. Um, regulations are is still really in infancy. So for and now, yes. Yeah, for now, yes. But people are like fighting regulation because it doesn't fit the, the core principles. But all right, so if we all feel pretty good about the block, the blockchain and everything, I'm going to continue. Does anybody else have any other questions? I have one question. Um, when something goes wrong, like for instance, you transfer your bitcoins to the wrong or yeah, you lose them forever. No, you lose them forever. So you're responsible to like be your own bank. Um, and that's if you, a pretty big deal for it's a pretty big deal for our modern society. But if you think about all of past history, where there were were no uh, credit cards or uh, you know insurances, yeah. people have been their own banks for for thousands of, of millennia. Like. Yeah, but that would be a huge reason for a lot of people or companies not to participate in something like this. That if you lose a million dollars. Yeah, well, there's there are certain, there are some Bitcoin companies that operate like a bank, like Coinbase, for instance, will insure your Bitcoin and will help you and have customer support, customer service. But uh, so some consumers choose to use companies like that where they feel safer. Or they you know they don't maybe they don't trust themselves. Then there's other consumers that are like, um, I, want, I want to always control my finances. I don't want someone to be able to block my account or tell me I can't have my money. So I'm not going to put my Bitcoin even anywhere on a network and their, their Bitcoins won't even ever touch the internet. And they'll be like written on paper or inscribed uh, in wood or, or fabricated in metal. And then those keys become their sole responsibility. So there's... It depends on the, the philosophy of like the individual and what they want to do. But your concern is valid, and that's one of the reasons why um, some, you know, there's not mass adoption because some people are scared and nervous about that. And you know, my own personal advice is, um, you know, have some of both, like have traditional banking because you need it in this world, but also have the ability to be the complete owner of a portion of your wealth. Because you don't know what could happen, and if you if you are the one owning it, then you could at least, you know, at least that's the theory behind Bitcoin. Hopefully, it keeps going up because it could also turn to nothing, and then you have no wealth. But. <coughs> final, final point. Oh, okay. Because you already touched on it. Like, okay, there's, there was there's been a lot of stories about this people that, for example, they put their bitcoins on a hard drive and then they throw it away and then. Later they find out it was worth millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, but my point is, um, let's say that Silk Road closes, there's thousands of bitcoins that go out of the system. And there's only 80 or million or whatever many bitcoins that are going to be produced ever. My question is, are there going to be new ones, uh, mines to replace or there? Uh, yeah. So let me, so I yeah. think, wait, let me continue the, continue the talk. Okay. It's going to answer that. All right. All right, so uh, lots of time for questions at the end. All right, so now we understand that the Bitcoin network, um, anybody can be part of it. You're able to get the full ledger. 
because you, you're able to understand everything that's ever happened, um, you, you're able to trust it because you have full access. No one is corrupting the ledger. You have, no one is, uh, it's not sitting behind a data center somewhere. So uh, as the blocks are mined um, and people are getting Bitcoin into the market, every 10 minutes there's about 25 release, released um, by these miners. Um, you might ask, all right, like you just asked you know, a few minutes ago, well, now there's a bunch of miners controlling everything, and that's not good. Um, well, Satoshi um, thought about this, and he has basically made the system so that unless you control 51% of the blockchain, so unless you control 51% of the computers in the network, you can't alter or hack the system. And since the Bitcoin network could be used by anybody in the whole world, you would need to know where these 51% of people lived. So even if you got a few big mining pools, you knew where they were, they're in Iceland and China. You need to find um, others um, and then know exactly what uh, their security is like, what servers they may be running, where they're located, and then hack it all at once. And that would cost uh, you probably billions of dollars to find that, if not trillions of dollars, because they could be anywhere in the whole world. Um, and since it's anonymous, you're, it's not like somebody knows who they all are. So the blockchain will forge on, and will always forge on, and uh, it can never go back, it can never be erased, it will always go forward, um, because for it to be erased, everybody in the whole network would have to erase everything at once, and that's never gonna happen. Um, so it will always move forward, and it can never be hacked unless you had over 51% of the network, the power, and it, the power of 51% of the network. So does that does that make sense? Does that do you guys get that? That's like a really core thing because a lot of people always say to me when I say I work in Bitcoin, they're like, "Oh yeah, is that safe?" And I'm thinking, actually, it's like one of the safest things in the world because, you know, ING, you could quite easily know where all their data centers are and, and make a simultaneous attack. The Bitcoin network is larger than any supercomputer that exists on this earth. And its power is in its distribution. It's decentralized. So no, it can't get hacked. And yes, it is safe. It's secure. It's secure by mathematics. So I just want to make that point really strongly. Can the biggest miners in the world collude to make it one percent? Let's say three or four, they have ten or fifty percent of the mining each, and they decide together to change and well, why would you do that? That would then they would destroy the network and then all the money they invest in would be gone. Yes. So what he's saying is the miners, they own a lot of Bitcoin. They have thousands of Bitcoin, if not more. And if they were to corrupt the network or collude, then people wouldn't believe in Bitcoin anymore and everybody would dump it and the price of Bitcoin would drop to like nothing. So they would lose their fortunes. Mm -hmm. And they also have a lot of investment. And if they collude and ruin the whole network, they'll never be able to pay back their creditors all the money they lent them for their, for their server farms. Also, miners are in competition with each other because they want to be the ones to validate the most blocks per day so they make the most money per day. So they would never want to share that profit when they could just grow their own farms to, 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 mm. to win it. All right, so some more important facts about Bitcoin. Um, there only will ever be 21 million Bitcoins ever created. So it's deflationary. Um, right now, there's about 14 million Bitcoin that have been created. And every, about every 10 minutes, 10 Bitcoin come into the market as these minor, as these blocks are validated. Now, the amount of bitcoins that come into the market will be halved every at a set set periods. So I think the next halving is about in a, in 2016, um, and they'll half. So so it went 50, 25, 12.5, and so forth until the year 2140. The year 2140, the last the bitcoin, the 21th millionth bitcoin. Oh, wow. Will be, uh, will, be create, will be mined. So you might say, okay, well, once the Bitcoins are all mined, why do miners want to validate the blocks? Because miners also get the transaction fees 
that are part of each block. So for me to send, it, for me to have Bitcoin and send Bitcoin, say to you, I have to pay a very small fee and the to the miner. So right now that fee is like not even a cent. Um, and then in every block, the miner gets the reward and collects all the fees. But as the reward of Bitcoin goes down, the fees will go up. So now for your fee. So now the fee might not be less than a cent. Maybe it's a full cent, or maybe it's two cents. And the miners who validate the blocks get to keep all those fees. And if more people, uh, like Satoshi predicts, uh, use Bitcoin, these fees actually will be a lot of money. Because collectively, they'll add up to a significant reward. So the miners are still incentivized to to create these blocks and solve these hash rate problems and validate the ledger because they'll be the winner of the fees if they do so. And that's a very strong business model still in the fee mining. So it, he made, a, Satoshi made a way for currency to slowly enter the market. Um, he also made it deflationary so it can't, uh, we can't have the same problems we have now with inflation. And he also continued to make it sustainable by letting miners receive transaction fees to validate the blocks. So the system is self-motivating. It will always keep going because everybody is economically incentivized to participate in it in the correct and proper way so that they either retain the value they have or help uh, grow their value by validating these blocks. What happens with the value of the Bitcoin at the moment? The Bitcoin um, is half among the Bitcoin in circulation. So you said in 2016, yeah. the mined Bitcoin will be half. Yeah, the, mo the, the reward for the mined block will be halved. So now the miners get 12, uh, oh, uh, sorry, 25, then they'll get 12.5. So there'll be, so they'll be uh, the same uh, Bitcoin in circulation. It will continue to grow steadily but the miners will just be receiving less, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, at first that's gonna be a shock. You're gonna be getting 25 and then you get 12.5, but hopefully by then, you know, the price will be at a point where it's still very, uh, it still makes sense for them to, to do so. If not, the transaction fees need to rise to compensate for that loss in Bitcoin. And then people um, sending transactions, there's, there's these, uh, 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 fee-aware wallets like ours um, that will tell you that you need to increase your fee to be part of the next the next transaction block. So they will become more prevalent, and fees will be more um, dynamic than they already are, so that um, your transaction is able to be included in the next block. So where you might be like, I don't want to pay fees you're paying a lot lower fee than you would if you were using any other type of like financial instrument. Like I just made a financial transaction today over the phone. And they're like, okay, six ninety five fee for this, twenty four ninety five fee for that, and blah blah blah. And I'm like, what? If I did it with Bitcoin, I'd pay like less than a cent. So what happens if like in the worst case scenario, people don't want to pay the fees and for the miners it might not be as rewarding anymore since like the mining fees are halved. Is it possible that just that it crashes or like, it just dies? No yeah. Yet, that's that's not a great or question. Is there anything else to do? So uh, why I like Bitcoin is it really is pure economics. So your question is more um, it could be applied to anything, not just Bitcoin. So hand to the market. Whatever the market is valuing uh, Bitcoin at is its price. Similar to the way we value like a stock or uh, back in the olden times, um, uh, milk would be worth like two slices of uh, two loaves of bread. So it's hand to the market. So if the market believes it has value and the, the coin, Bitcoin has value, then it will, it will, the price will be reflective of that. And people will pay those fees because then they, they, they believe in the value of what they're using. But if people decide to say, you know, this currency is not worth the fees, it's not worth all this, you know, any of it, then yes, it could crash, but that could happen with anything. Like, 
it could happen with the euro. If we all were like, you know, screw this, like, this could be worth the, not even the paper it's printed on. So, if I feel strongly that it's, it's more economic theory, like anything could become worth nothing. But why I like Bitcoin, it's like pure hands of the market. There's no government control. There's no body of control. So it's purely what like you guys, what you guys, what you guys say it's worth. And what the, like, the economy participating in the market sure. yeah, values it. And that's why the price is so volatile. Because it changes all the time based on opinion. So, we sell the product we have in life so volatile, but you say that the Bitcoin is deflationary yeah. um, currency. So, what is my, my incentive? I have one Bitcoin. What is my incentive to spend it now as opposed to keep it for a year and then make see it more worth next year? Yeah. Um, and this is what is going to keep, eventually, is going to what's going to keep the network living is the fees of the transaction. Yeah. But I know my money is going to be worth more next year because there are no more new coins print, um, minted. I keep it out of the circulation. And uh, how does uh, how yeah. is this going to? So like the problem you're describing is like the is like the amount of liquidity in the market, and yeah. that's that's an issue because for Bitcoin, merchant adoption and usage of it is low. There's not as many places to use Bitcoin as there there should be to increase the transaction volumes every day. So yeah, that is a problem. People holding onto their coin and not participating in the the daily uh, market for it. Yeah, that's a, that's a risk. That's something that um, you know people are addressing in articles all the all the time. Like I can't comment too much on it, but I but it is a risk that that Bitcoin faces. All right. So, Bitcoin. What are people doing with it? Right now, um, there's a lot of transactions that happen in trading. People are speculating on the price. They're, they're buying it on an exchange, they're selling it on an exchange, they're making a few extra dollars, they're losing a few extra dollars. Um, people are buying precious metals. Gold is a big thing people buy with uh, Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of places that are offered these types of things because there's no intrinsic value to Bitcoin, or so people say, um, and they want to trade for something that, that does have that. So there's been a, a lot of uh, startups that have said, hey, go for Bitcoin. Um, but precious metals is, is a huge thing people use it for. There are a lot of places that accept it, like for beer, for coffee. So you could take uh, your wallet and actually spend the Bitcoin. Um, so how do you spend it? Uh, you have an address um, that you're able to send, or you've, sorry, you have a wallet, a digital wallet that you're able to send and receive Bitcoin to and from. So let's say I went to um, Cafe Cobalt here in Amsterdam and I wanted to, sp to spend uh, Bitcoin there. I wanted to buy a beer with Bitcoin. I'd take my digital wallet and I would enter the amount that the beer costs and I could either scan a QR code at the bar or I could copy the address of the bar and then send them the Bitcoin. So how do you send a coin? All right, every coin has a private key. And you, in your wallet, you have an address. Uh, or sorry, you, so you could, in those wallets, you own the private keys. And you then take your private key and you want to send it to somebody. And then it becomes a public key. And then it, it goes to that person and becomes their private key. So there's a lot of mathematics that I won't pretend I understand to make this transaction happen. But basically, it's all using cryptography to make this happen. If Ru Ruben, if you have any thing there you want to add that makes it sound better. Yeah, like their private key doesn't become a public key and then there, it, it, you move the, you create a transaction from your private key, which is in the network resembled by an address, uh, which contains a certain amount of Bitcoin, and then you make a transaction from your address to the address that resembles uh, the other person's private key. And then it's again protected by his private okay. key, and he needs to use his private key, which is held in your wallet. So is your address your public key then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So a wallet. Think about your, your wallet in your pocket. You've all the, uh, you've all these different 
sections to put your credit card and your cash and all that stuff, right? So like a Bitcoin wallet, it has multiple addresses. So instead of like pockets for different cards, you have multiple addresses because you only ever want to use an address once. So you have one wallet, multiple addresses that represent every transaction you've made to send and receive. And when you send it to somebody, that person also has a wallet and they have multiple addresses. Now there's more addresses uh, available, combination of addresses available for Bitcoin uh, than would take all the compute in the entire world of uh, the length of the universe to, to write down. So basically there are, all, there are infinite possibilities for addresses. So it's okay that you have an, a different address for every transaction because there's so many possibilities we'll never get to them all in any of our lifetimes or any of our children's children's lifetimes. Um, so this might be getting a little, a little too much. But basically, all you need to know is you have a digital wallet. It, it houses your Bitcoin, it keeps your Bitcoin. You buy Bitcoin, you put it into this wallet. Um, you spend Bitcoin, you spend it from this wallet. And the person you're um, spending it, or you're giving it to, or, you're, or um, they also need to have a wallet to be able to receive it. So that's how you're able to talk to each other and transact with Bitcoin. Unless the person you sent it to coded it all from scratch. And but <laughs> I'm guessing we're all in this room, nobody's doing that. <laughs> um, all right, so it might be a little obs obscure, but that's why I want to offer everybody something here in the room that I think will help them understand it more. So you really need to see to believe. Um, so Blocktrail, we actually have a mobile wallet. And for anybody that wants to you know, see what it looks like and understand you know, how to send a transaction um, or how to receive Bitcoin, uh, I would invite you to download the wallet because we have a special promo code for this event and like everybody could get 0.01 BTC. Which today is worth about two euro, but if the future, goes the way we all hope, it could be worth thousands of euro. Um, so, the best, way to, the best way to really understand Bitcoin is to start using it. So it doesn't, oh. Well, if you say that it's applied like any economics, is it possible to steal a wallet? If you steal a computer, everything is set up, yeah. it's like stealing a wallet. So, still a computer. Yeah, we can never get it back because there's no nothing attaching you mainly to that yeah. account. It is able, you're, you are able to steal a wallet. So if you were to steal my phone, you would have to know my password to my block trail wallet. You'll have to hack that. You'll have, you'll have to also hack my PIN code. Um, Similar like uh, yeah. stealing a credit card and then trying to get in. Yeah, but you could also steal like the cash in my pocket from me. Yeah. Um, and if you steal cash, there's also no way to recover cash. Or if I lit this cash on fire, it'll never come back. Yeah. That's why people that are ultra secure, some you know, they don't even let their wallets touch the internet to be able to be hacked. But also, it's why companies like like us, Blocktrail, we have different types of security in place. One thing is called multi-signature. So to, to, for a Bitcoin transaction to be sent, you need to be able to uh, have a signature. And I don't mean a signature as in like you write your name. It's your password, right? But with Blocktrail, you need two of three um, signatures for the transaction to be valid. So let's say somebody stole your phone and tried to send you know, 100 Bitcoin out of your wallet. Like you could have had some, something set up with Blocktrail that said only let me spend you know one Bitcoin a day, and because we're multi-signature, we're able to set that up for you. And if we notice that someone is spending, you know, trying to spend you a hundred, we won't sign the other transaction. So you so only one signature will be present, the one that was hacked, and we won't do that. So there's different there's different security security uh, things in place that could negate some of these risks, but if you look at Mt. Gox, if you look at some other things that happened, or if you look at BitPay, you know, they just got hacked, social engineering. Um, so there's definitely a lot of people trying to hack and steal people's Bitcoin. Um, but the thing that will help prevent that is you being the owner of your private keys. 
So your private keys are your Bitcoin. So going in real life. What? Yeah. It's like in real life. You, uh, careless in real life. And you yeah. This is quite like a good analogy I have, like back to the, 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 the euro. If I put this euro in my pocket, I, I own it, right? And if someone comes and they want to steal my euro, they have to take it out of my pocket and steal it. If I put this 50 euro in I, at IMG, I may still own the 50 euro, but now everybody knows ING has a lot of people's money. So they could go and steal a, a rob ING. And I lose my 50 euro. Similar with private keys. On our wallet, your private keys are on your phone. So if someone was t to rob you, they need to hack you and get your stuff. They don't hack Blocktrail because Blocktrail may have thousands of wallet users, but we don't have access to any of, any of the keys. Then you'd never be able to know how much it is in your Bitcoin wallet because it's all anonymous. It would be solitarily uh, guessed if I steal a phone. Oh, there's a wallet, a Bitcoin wallet. It is not possible for a thief, let's say, I deliberately go to Anna and I steal her phone. He probably, unless I told him how much is on there, it's not possible for him to know ahead, right? Yeah, it's so, sort of like, it's like a Bitcoin company, people might know where the company is, know where the data center is, and know how to get access to it. But they won't know who the users are. And they won't know where you are in the world, and they won't know what device you have something on. So they'll have to find out who you are, and then find how to hack your particular uh, device and you the security you may have around it. So yeah, by being the owner of your <coughs> private keys, it's way more secure than, let's say, Coinbase, which owns everybody's private keys for all of its 4 million user wallets. Um, so if Coinbase got hacked, everybody loses their money. If Blockchain got hacked, you guys all keep it, and we're just really sad. I, I don't understand that, but that's my fault. But um, you, you've got my user ID and yeah. my password, so... I don't have your password. Uh, you, I need to make an account, right? Yeah. At Blockchain. Yeah, we don't... We so what do you do then with, with those... You make an account, so yeah. there is a trace which can lead to my phone or to my keys. Um, the, like, the keys have to be generated, they're uh, a random number between one and something like a one and I think 26 zeros mm -hmm. or something. Uh, and those, like whenever you create a wallet, you need to generate one of these keys. Mm -hmm. But these are generated in your phone, so they're never like Rockdrill doesn't know your private key. It doesn't leave your phone. Okay, but you know I've got an account. I do know that you have an account. Uh, and um, I think uh, if you want to run a normal Bitcoin client, um, it needs to continuously download all the blocks and all the transactions, which is too much for a phone to do, for example. So. That's what the Blocktrail servers do, and it gives your phone the information that you need. Uh, but that does mean that uh, the Blocktrail servers know a little bit about your Bitcoin. So I could figure out how much Bitcoins your you as a user have in your wallet, but I can't uh, access the Bitcoins. That's only something you can do. And we also don't necessarily know who you are. You can sign up anonymously, and you never actually need to connect your phone or your contacts or anything. Yeah, exactly. So that's possible too. Yeah, so okay. it's completely okay. possible okay. to be completely anonymous, have your own control, and then still use our services to yeah. to get the balance and okay. to be able to sign the transaction. That's a good. Okay. I understand. What's your business model in there? Nothing yet. <laughs> right now, we uh, right now our app is free. Um, we will be offering the ability to, you know, buy and sell, and at that point, um, there'll be a, a, a charge for that. We're looking to put financial services into the wallet. So maybe mm -hmm. the ability to invest in gold, or to um, buy and sell Bitcoin as well, or anything else we can think of that also then uses Bitcoin. So while the core product itself, like the app, um, being your bank, spending and using Bitcoin, be completely free, then there might be additional services that users would like to use, and that's where we would then make some revenue. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, I'll invite everybody if they would like to try the app. Um, it's Block Trail, and then we could practice with each other and send it, and you could see like how it actually works. Um, 
But before we move on to that, like I, I tried to give like a quick, like high level without too much detail to like make everybody confused, um, but yet with enough detail that you kind of grasp what's going on. Does anybody feel like they get it now, or is everybody still really confused? There, there's so many things going on from all directions. You know, really <laughs> have to spend some time, like serious yeah. time, to um, see a little bit where it's going. Um, it's it, it is not uh, something that you'd be like, yeah, okay, ten minutes. Uh, okay. 10 yeah. Minutes. So there's a lot of questions you can you can ask. Um, like the more you read, the more questions. Yeah, you know, that's very true. Well, I, I struggle with the. I mean, everything's digital, right? But eventually, we tend to buy things that are not digital. Yeah. So, like I said, the beer. Whenever the beer manifests, like if the Bitcoin becomes beer, and whatever transaction it becomes reality, and therefore it becomes trainable. Right? I mean, like let's say an anonymous. Um, Wallet buys thousands of beers in the same bar, and the bartender gives those thousands of beers to that one person. It becomes really obvious as soon as it enters real life who the owner and the beneficiary is behind it. So let's say one million bitcoins. And you want to buy a flat. Yeah, the flat will be under your name, and everyone will know that that going is huge. So that that's okay though, because people are trying to get Bitcoin more to mainstream, so that it, it, it doesn't just have to be this anonymous secret society. Like it it's real. Like it, we want it to be where people um, use it and are proud to use it and put their name to it for a house or like for right. And that's the hope of the future that that that, that happens. But if you're using one address or a transaction you create. You may know who you are in that address, in that transaction. Yeah, so yeah. if it's the case that if you could buy a cup of coffee with your bitcoins that you got as salary the week before, then the person where you, you bought the coffee from could see, like, hey, this is your salary. Yeah, or the customer came back or anything like that. But So the key is that in, in one wallet, you should have multiple of these addresses, multiple of pockets, and you should spread your bitcoins out so that you don't need that. Uh, 100 bitcoins to pay for your coffee, you only need a tiny amount. So that's why your bitcoins should be divided a little bit smaller process so that they can't be linked together. So they can't be uh, uh, analyzed. And how small can you go down on the on bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can divide it to uh, 800 decimal. But that can be changed too. Uh, right now, that's the way that, that the four developers have, you know, that's what everyone's agreed on. But it could also be altered to be that. But right now, it's just the really um, Like, let's say Bitcoin has become really uh, worthy, then obviously you want to split it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, the million decimal places is called just a token. <laughs> All right, so does does anybody feel uh, like they they get it at least a little bit more than when they walked in the door? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions they want to ask? No. So how how do we get money on it to stay and stay anonymous? We're not getting Just for you, I'll send it to you right here live. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. How is the money created? Is it like when? Uh, for instance, everyone at the same time would uh, think of exchanging their bitcoins for euros. Would there be, um, how would it be possible? For every bitcoin that's created, does there disappear a euro? Do you, you know what I mean? Or, yeah. or a so, dollar or whatever? So the bitcoin has value with uh, which the market you know, values it. So right now it's like 200 euro, right? And I could take that, um, I, if I own one bitcoin, I could exchange it on exchanges like here in the Netherlands, BitTonix is a big one. I take that one Bitcoin and exchange it from one Bitcoin to 200 euro. But if everybody in the world wanted to take their Bitcoin and make it euro, then the value of the Bitcoin would go down. Similar, think about a stock, right? If everybody tries to sell their shares at once, the value of the stock will, will go down. It's all about supply and demand and what the market um, values it at. But you could change, but Bitcoins are created through the mining process and they're exchanged into euro when people want to take 
Bitcoin and, and, and make it become fiat currency, so euro, dollar, the currency we all we all know today. But they don't they're not tied to each other. They're just exchanged. Like if I owned um, a share of a uh, you know public company, I could take that share and change it into currency mm -hmm. if I want. But that doesn't mean they're linked. They just they each equal something. Does that answer your question? Uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge to make Bitcoin in mainstream currency? Uh, I think uh, people need to believe in it. And if you believe in it and you believe it as value, then I think it could be widely adopted. So it's not the technology that we should change? I think people need to realize the problems that they that do exist right now. If you look at, for example, Greece, that's a really nice example of what can happen if you if you're tied to the financial system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but also, financial privacy is a big thing. So, when you do your tax report in the Netherlands, like we all, or at least anyone who has done it here, all the information is there because they already know everything about you. Banks will tell the government anything they want. Um, that, like, I hate to do that, but there's so many things nowadays where you're giving up privacy without give even me, knowing. Give me your QR uh, code and I'll send it to and you. And at some point you'll feel uh, yes. like people start to hurt. Like there will be some point where uh, giving up your financial privacy. Will you will type be something in here. So that's the thing. Like people need to, like either people need to learn, like feel the pain or of the financial system that we're part of right now, uh, which is really hard because most people are completely ignorant of anything. Like most people still think that whenever you're, um, that all bank, all money in banks are is tied to gold, or that whenever you're depositing your savings, that that's lended to someone else, which is a story all from the 90s. Um, or alternatively, that needs to be something really good, like. Um, like a real problem that the technically solved. So one of the, the best cases is uh, when you want to send to, uh, to a, a fertile country some uh, euros. Um, you. Now right now we do it through Western uh, uh, Western Union, and you pay about 10 to 50 percent in fees. Uh, and there, this company is really solving issues right now because with Bitcoin you can send to Africa for well a few cents. Um, you like the company doing that for you will still charge you a little bit, but they won't charge you 15% like Western Union. Mm -hmm. So there's these things which it really solves, Instead and that's the things that need to just keep growing for Bitcoin to keep growing. Yeah. And if we run the problem that mainstream currency needs to be regulated for tax purposes, for refresh or something? Yeah, of yeah. course. You pull I mean, it down. Do you pull it down. Will still will be a part of like Coinbase? What can be this? It worked for you. Um, I mean, you could keep all your cash, or all your euros right now in cash oh, too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll see them after the session. But first of all, all it's a felony. So if they do figure it out, it will be at least fine or jail time for it. Um, and it's still really hard if you want to do everything in cash because you still get your salary, which you then somehow have to hide. Uh, you have to ask your employer to not declare his taxes because that's how you figure out what salary you're making. Um, so, if you want to pay your rent, then you have to pay everything in cash. So you should compare it mostly to electronic cash. So, yeah, you can uh, try to avoid taxes, but it becomes really hard if you want to do everything you're doing uh, in cash. So, in Bitcoin, it's the same. The, the yeah, but this is not cash that you can easily end up in the other end of the world. You guys have a 10 million in cash and have to fly a plane and bring it to your viewer. But if you, if you get that 10 million as a uh, like from your employer, then uh, the, the tax agency still knows that you got that, that money in the first place. Like it's not without uh, trace because uh, if the person sending it to you or the person getting it from you does report it to the tax agencies, then they know that it was you in between. Right, I'll give you another, another uh, case that is kind of worse. So let's say that there's a somebody, yeah, somebody gets my Bitcoin somehow. I found out how I got scammed, but now the the money is in the other end of the world, so I can never recover. Yeah, so you've got it. No, 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 it's fine. I have I have a big plan.
Yeah, so the, the, yeah, it's, it's easier for, for a criminal to try to move uh, the money out of his jurisdiction. I mean, no one ever hacks, a, uh, or barely anyone ever hacks a normal bank. Because if you hack ING's computer, or even if they just give me the password and I can do whatever I want in their system, uh, and I move away 5 million to some account of mine, then they have connections, even if I move it to the US, for example, they'll have the connections to reverse that and to make sure that I'm, I can't spend it in, uh, in America. Uh, also because banks uh, don't, like your transactions on the bank are not instant, they only settle at the end of the night, really. Um, so they have some time also to, to uh, undo your transaction or they have the connections to make sure that you can't spend it on the other end. Uh, with Bitcoin, there's nothing there, so yeah, it does mean that if someone steals your Bitcoin, he moves it away. There's no. It's really a lot harder to uh, to get it back. One thing that Bitcoin does add, though, is the transparency. So, if if all merchants, everyone accepting Bitcoin, were to use a system that tells them if Bitcoins were from a stolen uh, origin, for example, they could then deny any services people would try to gain from them through using these stolen Bitcoins. And because everything is publicly in the ledger, you can follow Bitcoin through to the source. So, at some point along the way you uh, go to authorities, you, pro you give proof that your bitcoins were stolen, then they mark this as stolen bitcoins. And then if all services were within this whole network of blacklisting this address, they wouldn't accept the coins from it. Only people on the dark market, black, you know, um, illegal activities would be the ones uh, accepting your bitcoin. But there still wouldn't be anyone to financially restitute you unless, you know, someone was to maybe, if these people try to use your uh, stolen bitcoins, they accept it, and then they deny this person their services and return the stolen bitcoins. So I know that this is possible because with cash you lose the trade. You have, if I steal your money and I go spend at the shop, they have no way of proving that this is stolen money. But with bitcoin, you've always got the history throughout, so you can you can actually try and figure out. This so thing. somewhere down the line, you can be surprised by, hey, we got your <coughs> you coin. We got we found yeah. the coin. It was we yours. Found the coin. We, we got your history. Right. We got your fingerprint on it. So it is actually possible with bitcoin. So in some sense it's worse, in some sense it's better. Yeah, it's some sense it's bad to be a criminal Bitcoin. It doesn't work. Yeah. Can you uh, launch your Bitcoin and No, no, you can't. It's, no, oh, it's, 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 it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it would be difficult because you have to try and remain anonymous all the time. But on the dark web you can. Remain but what are you going to buy with it? You're gonna, so you no, I mean if you can launder it there and then you take it back on the website. So you need to turn your Bitcoin into something that you can live with it. So you could maybe buy, um, I mean, you'd have to buy something that's available on the dark web, maybe drugs or guns, and you have to sell them for actual cash. So it's still the risk involved. And anything you might buy, any um, actual uh, you know, physical object you could sell, has to be delivered to you somehow. So then you actually have to pick it up in person. You can have an FBI agent impersonating a, a merchant on the dark web, and then they actually meet you directly in person and put you in cuffs. So basically you're just saying that you need a diversified criminal organization that is also into drugs to liquidate the money. You need to find a way of Yeah, so this is too specific, but yeah, it's, it is not, in, it is quite possible. Yeah. At the moment it's probably a bit more yeah. possible, but further down the line, as more people converting from Bitcoin to uh, fiat currency, require KYC, so you have to identify yourself, give your passport, give your address, then it's almost impossible to go from Bitcoin to fiat without people knowing exactly who you are. So then it's even harder to launder this kind of money. Um, I worked with a couple of guys that were programming and they had lots of fun in the mornings to check what their yeah, Bitcoin project. They were speaking of light coins and different kinds of coins. It's, there's not just one, right? Yeah, there are, there are other coins that were created, um, but Bitcoin is, is the main coin. And then there's these other coins, like yeah, Litecoin, like Dogecoin. Like some of these coins, <laughs> are, some of these coins are scams. Some of them are real. So they're, they're different coins that have their own ch um, blockchains and stuff. But it's the same principle, just different name and then a small group, I guess. Yeah, so they have different, they're, they're not exactly the same. Like they all have different pieces to them. But it is the same, you know, along the same lines. But some have different types of, um, you know, security or protocols or whatever. But yeah, people have created other coins that they think could rival Bitcoin. Some people say that there'll be coins like for everything. You know, maybe governments or companies will have their own. But is there something called Bitcoin or that's a bad one? What is it? 
Some, some measure of something called book coin? <laughs> I don't yeah. know about that. Everything. <laughs> but the, so if you guys are all registered on the meetup page, I'm going to send out to the group three videos that um, have really helped me like crystallize in my head like a lot of the process. And you know we just like talked through it today, and that's hard. But this is actual like video um, where they'll actually go through with like some nice animations and um, some more some more uh, calculations that might help you know what you've heard today like really start to crystallize because you need to hear it like multiple times different means. So I'll send that out to the meetup group. But if you also want to make sure you, you like, I send it to your e your email or whatever, just like at the end. Give me your email and I'll, and I'll definitely send. Cool. They're about 30 minutes in total. Um, cool. So it's a little bit of uh, the, the first one's a minute and a half. The oh. second one is five minutes. <laughs> so if you get bored after those seven, you don't have to watch the 22 minute one. But the 22 minute one is it actually goes into some of the mathemati mathematics behind the blockchain. So for me, I like the light to learn that part. I have another question that I have to Bitcoin. Okay. What other startup or beginning on the blockchain are you most excited about? So that doesn't have to do with financials. Um, so what she's asking basically, people, the next thing people are doing is, is like blockchain tech. So digitalizing any type of asset and putting it in the blockchain. Like within the Bitcoin tra transaction, there's a small place to put other types of data. That's what you're asking, right? I don't know. I still, I'm still like thinking about how it could be used, like what would be the right use case. I know it's, it just, I know it's something really powerful that has the potential to alter the way we do anything, but I, I still don't know what I feel is, is, I feel like we need, a, we need to spend more time discovering what's next than like calling it out just yet. I don't know. Ruben, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah. Um. Yeah, so to be clear, like um, when you're doing Bitcoin transactions, like Sarah said, there's this little piece of, of space in every transaction where you can put some extra information. And what you can do with that, for example, is um, instead of like calling something a Bitcoin, you can say, okay, this Bitcoin is actually a gold coin, even though you're using Bitcoin for it. Uh, <laughs> without making the whole different points that she was talking about. Uh, so that means that I could say like, okay, my one gold bar here resembles one gold coin and then I can start trading that. And I could, for example, have a contract which states that if you own that, that one gold coin, you have a uh, legal right to collect the gold bar when you want to. Uh, but you can also use it, for example, to resemble your car key. So you could say that um, if you have the, the app, the wallet that holds the, the coin that I've called my car key, uh, you could walk up to my car and with that app, you could unlock my car and start driving. And then if you're done with that car, you just hand the, uh, the, the, the coin to the next person, which you could, don't have to do physically. You could send it to someone who's coming in from the US only next week, and you just send the coin to his wallet, and then he gets to the car. Yeah. So there's these all special things that you could also do with uh, using the Bitcoin network, which provides security that it, that it already does. Um, and then there's a whole, like, there's so many crazy ideas you can do with this. A lot of them are more hype than uh, really useful. But there's also really cool stuff in there. Uh, and especially with a lot of companies thinking about the Internet of Things as a term, which is basically just taking any stupid device and making it smart. So yes. having your, your toaster order your bread for you automatically, or your uh, refrigerator restock on the things that you need. Um, this be a really useful thing for, for these devices to own uh, Bitcoin so they can buy stuff for you, but also to use this to transact data. Right now, I think I, the thing I really like is uh, Ascribe, which is a company that's trying to put uh, copyright of, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the blockchain. So they'll, like you can prove that you own a certain uh, piece of art or uh, yeah, like a certain image that is yours. Uh, and then other people can uh, can find that on their platform, but it uses Bitcoin, so anyone can access that data. Uh, and that way you can see, like, okay, this is this person's art, and I should be paying him uh, when I want to use his image on my website or on my blog or things like that. Mm, 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 mm. 
that's just one of the examples, there's like a lot of them. Uh, there's also, for example, a company that does uh, uh, warranties of, uh, I think, TVs on the blockchain, which means that whenever you get a Samsung TV, you also get something in your wallet that resembles the warranty on that. Uh, and you can go back to Samsung and just say, like, hey, I bought this three years ago, I still want you to fix my, my uh, TV, and it's also easy to transfer to the next person, because, again, I can just send it to anyone who also owns a wallet, and then that person can go to Samsung with it. And you don't have the stupid piece of paper that you have to around. <laughs> that I always do. <laughs> so, uh, if you guys want to, to now use your first Bitcoin, um, <coughs> this meetup group lets you use uh, Bitcoin Amsterdam. What we usually like to do uh, is go out to a place that accepts Bitcoin. So, you're all welcome to come to the next one, and then you could maybe make your first transaction and get a coffee or get a beer. Probably going to be scheduling it shortly, maybe in the next few weeks. So. I hope to see you at our next event, and that's all I have, unless uh, anyone has another question or wants to.